Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, after, that, after that introduction, I'm very conscious now I have to slow down. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's not the first time I've been told that. Uh, but maybe that's the way my brain works. I have to speak fast or don't get the words out. Anyway, um, it would be hard not to speak fast and be energized because I've been only in the room here for a short while. And there's a lot of energy in this room and a lot of people who have brought a lot of energy to the day and obviously to their lives because of what they're doing. So um, it is a good place to be. I always like to be in places where there's people who have a zest for life, who bring energy to the company that they're in, uh, because that can only be good for anything that they go to do. So good to be here, and, and, and thank you for the welcome. Uh, <clears throat> well, those of you who heard me before, and I think some people did up, up, up north, um, you have to listen to me again. It's very similar that I'm going to share with you. So um, if you enjoyed some of the little jokes that I told, then be prepared to laugh again, because that'll keep me right. <laughs> and I like to begin with those little story, one of those little stories, because I think it's good to set people in the right frame of mind to listen to the rest, if you have a little bit of fun to begin with. So this first story is about the atheist and the bear. So the atheist was walking through the woods one day. What majestic trees, he said to himself. What powerful rivers, what beautiful animals. As he was walking alongside the river, he heard a rustling in the bushes behind him. He turned to find a seven-foot grizzly bear charging towards him. He ran as fast as he could up the path. He looked over his shoulder and he saw the bear was closing in on him. Then he tripped and fell on the ground. He rolled over to pick himself up, but he saw the bear was right on top of him, reaching for him with his left paw and raising his right to strike him. At that instant, the atheist cried out, Oh my God. Time stopped, the bear froze, and the forest was silent. As a bright light shone upon the man, a voice came out of the sky. You deny my existence for all these years. Teach others ungodly things, and even credit creation to cosmic accident that boomed. Do you expect me to help you out of this predicament? Am I to count on you as a believer? The atheist looked directly into the light and answered, It would be hypocritical of me to suddenly ask you to treat me as a Christian now, but perhaps you can make the bear a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, the voice said. The light went out and the sounds of the forest resumed. The bear slowly brought both paws together, bowed his head and said, Lord, bless this food which I'm about to receive <laughs> from thy bounty. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so anyway, you share my sense of humor. That's not too bad. That's a good start. Um, I'm going to speak to you or share a few thoughts with you, I suppose, around three aspects of what I think is important for people in, in any walk of life who want to do better for themselves and who want to be ambitious for life, if you like. And it's kind of, it's about leadership, it's about motivation, and it's about teamwork. And I think those things, my talk to you and my sharing with you will, will have an integrated version of those things. So um, I read a lot of coaches from basketball, coaches in America, and other coaches in, in other sports. I like to see what their thinking is and how they go about making things happen with the place they find themselves. And John Wooden is a basketball coach who 50 years coached in, in, in the States and was a really good man uh, because it wasn't just about uh, coaching the sport of basketball, it was about how he worked with the people. So he, he, he worked with people first and then the skill set of basketball after that. So he, he made people better and then made them better players. I think that's in essence of what you're about yourselves too. So anyway, he endorsed the famous quote from Gandhi, which was, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as though you will live forever. And that's not a bad philosophy to think about. You know, so live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as though you'll live forever because we have to learn every day we go out. If we don't, then we won't become leaders and we won't deliver the best of ourselves because the truth of the matter is that leaders never stop learning. And Ben Franklin made this apt observation about a fellow he had known in Philadelphia. He says, the man died at 25 but wasn't buried to 75. So there's a nice little message in that, you know, that very often we find ourselves in that place we, we qualify in something, inverted commas, and we think we're experts now. So that's it. We don't have to learn anymore, but we do. We have to learn every day we go out. Every day we wake up, we have to make it so, a day where we will improve some aspect of our life. And that's what he really means by that, that we don't want to switch off and stop and think that we're qualified at a certain time in our lives. We're always in the business of becoming better people. So wouldn't define his four laws of learning in this kind of way, he said there was explanation, so it's important that we explain things to people. If people don't understand what it is they're about, then they won't be able to do that, what they need to do with the, what they're trying to do. 
Uh, then demonstration is important. We've got to show people. We've got to, uh, you know, if you don't demonstrate what it is required. So you, by what you do, you're demonstrating to others how it is to be successful at what you're doing. Then this imitation uh, and, and, and adjustment where necessary. You know, it's not just do it and then expect that that's the way to be. You have to put your own, your own soul into it, if you like, your own heart into it, your own uh, person into it. And then repetition. And that's a key word that a lot of people think, you know, you shouldn't have to repeat things. You do have to repeat things. You have to go back. You have to give God a template for doing things. And then you go back and you keep doing it. And it's not just doing the same thing all the time. It's, in essence, you're trying to improve. You're trying to add value to what it is you do. So repetition can sometimes be taken up as you're just doing the same things over and over again. No, I don't believe it that way. I think repetition is, is drilling into ourselves that it becomes second nature and then we have time to add value because we don't have to think about the basics. And then we're adding value and adding quality. So I think that's an important thing to, just to be thinking about. Again, wouldn't summarize this then, uh, these four laws, uh, as I said, teaching by word and teaching by deed. And so that is the case. You know, we teach by word, we, we tell people things so that they hopefully understand. But there's no point in telling a great story and not actually doing the same story. People will be more inclined to do what you do rather than what you say. So this teaching by deed, he believed, was the most important. And, and of course, words can be powerful, but the power of individual example is much greater. So people can talk about how well they may have done something, but when you see people come up here, uh, for example, today, the top people in, in last year, well, you know they didn't get that by talking about it. They actually went out and did it. And as it was very clear from the, the, particularly the final speaker there, that she is a hard worker. And um, I won't forget her first name either because my wife's called Marion as well. So <laughs> um, well done to her and all the others who are up here. So what we're seeing here is people are more likely to respond to what you do rather than what you say. And that's a key thing that we need to think about if we want to develop a good team anywhere or anything in life. And again, I think that what was true and what we were listening to here and the short time that I was into, it is about demand the highest standards possible of yourself in all areas of your work. That's what it's about. It's about demanding high standards of yourself, not because somebody else is imposing it upon you, but because you choose to be a hard worker. You choose to do the best you can for yourself. So we really shouldn't be looking for others to be our quality control expert. We shouldn't really be looking for others to always be giving us the prompt to get out there and do it. We should actually be said to do that for ourselves. And again, we need to be our own harshest critic, if you like. Be, take a look at ourselves, as, as we often say in the North here, is catch yourself on in many ways. Take a look at what you're doing. Uh, so don't be content with the minimum requirement. Don't be content with the minimum requirement. In essence, strive to make your average above average. If you don't aim high, then you'll be content with the mediocre. So aim high, and if you don't get there, then you'll still be in a good place. So uh, we have to make our average above average. If that's, if that's what we're trying to do, make our average above average, then we'll not be doing ourselves a lot of harm. So again, it's about engaging with people. That's what good leadership's about. That's what you know, any coach is about. It's about getting out on the floor, on the field, into the workplace, wherever it is, uh, with your team. Again, as I said, demonstrating, instructing, uh, adding value, you know, adjusting where necessary bumping elbows with people, being in their company. That's going to be more effective than just talking about it from a distance. Get out there and meet those people. And you have to ask yourself, you know, is that your role? Is that what you're doing at the minute? Or, and, and we'd always ask ourselves, how effective could you be if you're hidden away somewhere in an office or if you're in, somebody thinks you're just in a nice little place that you've got to and you don't really care where anybody else gets there or not, that you're just sort of content with your own achievements. We have to be better than that. We have to be more giving than that. So, you know, how do you build relationships? How do you build a sense of these people in your team matter if you're not mixing with them, if they don't see you, if you don't spend time with them? That's what's, that's what's important. So if they never get a chance to rub elbows with you, so as we say, a coach or, or, or anyone who stays in the office sending out memos or sending out letters or sending out faxes or whatever it is in the old days, um, you won't have a great team. You'll have a great team if you're there, present to people, mixing with them, showing that you really care about them. Because quality leadership demands that you engage with your people. Again, people are talking about, you know, why does something work? Why is something successful? And um, it's, it's, it's often a very simple question, you think, and there's a very simple answer. It's because there's no replacement for sound fundamentals and discipline. 
when you do the basic things and do them well and have the discipline, and that is the discipline within yourself to keep doing the right things, even small little steps. And there's no point in thinking about too far ahead. Yes, you have it as a goal in the distance, but it's the little steps, it's the building blocks you put in place that will bring you to that place further on. So we don't think about needing to do something gigantic, if you like, in one step. We have to take it a little step at a time, but those fundamentals must be put in place and they will stand to us. So the importance of little things cannot be overemphasized. And I've often said this, I, I, I make the analogy to sport, you know, people have got to do the, the stuff on the training field to the best of their ability. I'm often quote here about if there's cones and things that we put down for people to go around to do some practice on the field, well, if they cut inside them, then the person behind them cuts inside a little bit more, the next person's even further in, and suddenly there are no standards. There's no high standards to go by. So we must set those standards, we must adhere to those standards, and we must apply them to ourselves and expect our team to take example from us rather than be told to do it, but watch us, watch us do it. So again, attention to little details, and making a habit of doing them right usually determines if a job's done well or done poorly. So that's very important for any organization and any group of people. And in essence then, you know, we talk about what makes us better people. And I think it's this whole idea of motivation. Motivation comes, there's many definitions of motivation, and people think often about those big, powerful speeches, if you like, and they always talked about Alex Ferguson and the hairdryer stuff that came out from time to time when he wasn't happy with what had happened. But that's all right once in a while, but that's, that's not something that can be sustained. The greatest motivation for anybody, any person, is for people to know that they're valued. When we let people know that they're valued, then they will become motivated. It's not our push, it's not us making them motivated. They decide somebody cares about me enough to talk to me, to share with me, to want to help me. Then those people will become motivated. And to do that, you have to look for ways to show that you care about the person. And that's very important. To be, to be aware of special events that matter to your people, and see, it can be birthdays, it can be sicknesses, it can be something in the family, it could be anniversaries, it could be health problems, any of these things you need, and you won't know about this unless you engage with the person and ask them about themselves. Instead of speaking about ourselves, just turn that all over and be the person who, who will ask of others how things are with them. Then you will get a clearer picture of what life's like for them, and you'll be able to see a better picture that's going on in their head. So, and they used to say here, remember, you cannot fax a handshake, but this, that's a long time ago. You can't, you can't send them by, by emails either, or you can't send them by WhatsApp. You have got to be there in person and present to them, and that's very important. So really then, if we're going to be a motivator, if we're going to motivate our team, then you have to be motivated yourself, and that's so important. And, you know, and to me, motivation's a choice. And I've always told people, and I don't see any better way to do this than say, the first chance you get to decide to be motivated is every day when you wake up, there's one of two things you can say, good morning God or good God morning. That's a fact. You know, that's, that's gonna be your day. Your day will be better or worse for it. So I think we need to be good morning God people as much as possible. And that means we'll be enthusiastic. We'll be enthusiastic about the day. We'll be glad to have this day to live. We'll be conscious of living in the moment. And okay, we will be aware of the past and we can plan for the future, but don't miss the present because of that. So let's be people who are enthusiastic because enthusiasm is infectious. And I am guarantee you cannot be around enthusiastic people and be lethargic yourself. At least you won't be comfortable being lethargic. You might be lethargic, but you'll not be comfortable. So if you're around enthusiastic people, then you've got to start getting off your rear end and being enthusiastic too. So that's just the fact of life. So then what we're seeing is here, be aware of the impact of your body language. You're never not seeing anything about yourself. You're always giving out vibes. And that's why it's important that you know about your body language and that you carry yourself with that kind of enthusiasm, that kind of zest for life, that kind of attitude that says, I really do like to be alive. I like to be in this moment. I'm going to enjoy this day. I'm going to work hard at it. So really, what I'm saying here is that external motivation is good, it's useful, it's necessary from time to time, but you don't want to be somebody who's draining your own energy, motivating others because you're giving it all the time. It's, you need to create motivated people. 
So what we're looking about is self-motivated people because self-motivated people uh, deliver consistent performances. And that's what we really need. We need consistency. It's great to get a, you know, I talk about in sport too. It's wonderful to see somebody taking a lovely high catch, coming down, beating two men, scoring a point. That's great, or even a goal. That's lovely. But if they don't do anything for the other 65 minutes, then I don't think they're great at all. You know, it might be good to look at once in a while. You like those people who are consistently going about the business of how can I be of value to this team? Where is the sort of hidden work that I can do that there's no glamour attached to, but I'm doing it because I know this is necessary for the end product to be as good as I want it to be. So think about that, that self-motivated person. And that's what leadership's about. It's about doing those things that aren't pretty. It's about doing the hard work when people think that you get to these places because you're very lucky or because you just hit the right people at the right time. That's not the case. You actually worked hard to find people who find other people to do equally hard work. And that's why it works, because you work hard to find those people. And you might have to go through a lot of people to find those people. I understand that perfectly well. So really, it's about taking responsibility for your own performance, taking responsibility for your organization. Um, and I suppose taking responsibility, in essence, is about character. I mean, there's many definitions of character. And I think this one's very important for us all to remember that Character is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. So we're not doing it to look credit, not doing it so somebody will speak well of us. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And if we are doing things because it's the right thing to do, then we will be successful in time. It mightn't be automatic, but it will come. And really what it is then, motivated people, self-motivated people are better team players. They're good to be around. They carry out their tasks with joy. And they just, you can see it in them that they love life and they love what they're doing. And I could see the vibes coming off the stage here today where people were talking about, I love this business, I love this work, um, and people are so delighted to be doing something that they love doing. And so that's what your chance is, love what you're doing, and then it doesn't become work, we all know that. But at the same time, you have to work hard to get to that place. Again, it's about, it's about communicating key information to your people and sharing information with your people is very important as well. And I say, just as active listening shows respect, so too does being open and sharing ideas. So we all of the people in our team are a resource. Sometimes we think we have to have all the answers. And yes, there is templates for success and we go to them by all means. But it's wonderful the resourcefulness that's in people that you meet on life's journey. And we should never actually miss out on the resourcefulness that is in our people by having them share their insights with us as well. And collectively then, we can give the best of all of that. So again, uh, good leaders communicate frequently. And an understanding that decisions have to be made that might impact on people uh, sometimes in life, then you're just doing that because it's for the greater good of the team. And I often give uh, the context of this in a sporting context as well, where players starting and not starting. So you, you know, you have to share with people the reasoning and the rationale behind why they're not starting. And I say it doesn't necessarily make it easier for them, but they understand it more. They understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, and they know that you're open and truthful with them. And that means that they can take on to being part of your team. So uh, it maybe sometimes you have, to, you have to just make choices. You, you have to let people know who's putting in the work right now and how they demand more of your time because they are demanding more of themselves. So it's about you know, getting that balance, understanding why that's there, and people, I think, will be understanding of that if you share that information with them. Again, people talk about team spirit, and sometimes people think that team spirit just happens automatically uh, because people are in the one way of thinking. They're in the same organization, same company, the same team, come from the same club, come from the same county, or whatever it is. And that's not the case. Team spirit is something that has to be built. It has to be created amongst the people that you work closely with. And you have to create something special. This group is special. That you want to be with these people. You like being with, this people, with these people. And that you create something special because you're working together. You're all creating something bigger than yourself. And that's what life's about. It's about giving of ourselves to create something bigger than ourselves. So our goal should be to create a great team rather than just a team of some great players. It's about the team. Get the team working. When the team's working and when our team works well, we all benefit. So it's great to be giving the best of ourselves to others so that the team can even be better for that. So really, when we think about it that way, and when the team comes first, then there's no place for selfishness, egotism, or envy. And I heard that word mentioned earlier today too, that, that you don't want to be egotistical about this. You really want to be a giver. You want to be somebody who's there for others. You want to be somebody who's present to others. It's about more than your own job. It's working to the highest level for the good of your group. 
So if you're seen to care about your group and to put yourself out for your group, then your group will, will, will work for you in the same way. So it's working with each other rather than for, maybe with the best word to be in, as we work with each other. So sometimes that's going to ask questions of us. If we want to get good at something, um, it won't happen in your comfort zone. You have to get out of your comfort zone. It's not w the way you just think things are going to... If somebody says, you know, God feeds the birds, but he doesn't throw the food into the nest. You know, so it's really, there's, there's, there's something about that. You know, we've got to get out and, and do something for ourselves. So it's about stepping out of our comfort zone. It's about, you know, prepared to uh, challenge ourselves, prepared to take rejection, prepared to find that you thought something was going to work in a certain way for you, and it didn't. But that isn't, should not stop you from, in, from pursuit of what you're about. So those setbacks are a natural part of the growth that's required to get out of your comfort zone. So really believe that actually that there's greater benefit sometimes in what appears like a rejection. It's maybe the best thing ever happened to you because it makes you stronger. It makes you know that you've been there before. And I think that's what happens in life sometimes. You know, when you've experienced things in life, well then you know that you can deal with it. And so if, it, if something happens against you again, you say, well, I've been there. I know I can handle that. I can handle that. And that's on a broad scale I can talk about that. So don't limit yourself again to what you are known to be about. Stretch yourself to new skills and believe that there's always room for growth within you. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how successful you think you are being, don't stop, don't set a limit on yourself. Don't cap it. Say, how can I add value to what I'm about? And if you can do that, then I think you'll be you'll be heading in the right direction. Again, uh, in the business that you're, that you're in, particularly, and in all businesses, in all walks of life, it's very much about people. There is, like, this is what it's all about. It's about the rapport that you build with people. And it's the engagement you have with people that makes you somebody that people would either like to be around or just wouldn't quite want your company so much. So be good company, and I think you have a better chance of being a good business person. And uh, that's about creating positive relationships with the people you meet. It's actually about having that bright outlook that we said on life, being motivated, being enthusiastic, being energized, letting people see that there's energy about you. And, and I'm not saying that we're always Duracell battery people. Of course, we run, we run out of power from time to time. But really, we should be thinking, that's only a wee hiccup. Really, I love life. I, I have a zest for life. I love meeting people. And it's great to be around people. And there's something very unique about all the people we meet. And we won't understand or know that until we ask them, until we find out about them. So let's find out about the people who are working with us. Really get to know them, not just the face, but the person and what goes on in their background. It's the same as us in sport. We have really good footballers, and I just don't want to see them as talented players. I want to know what's going on in their lives, because sometimes the things that are going on in their lives can impact on their performance. It's no different in the world of business or work or anything else. What's going on in people's lives might impact on their performance, not just that they don't feel like doing it right now. So it's good to understand and know all that. So again, we must have a good time meeting people if we, if, if we expect them to have a good time meeting us. So it's about being good company. If you want to be in good company, then you have a great role to play in that yourself. Be that company. So again, I would suggest a few things that we need to think about is about being good listeners and practice active listening because God knows we don't do this often enough. Uh, you have to be aware of listening with the engine running. If we're listening just as somebody else stops so we can get talking and saying what we want to say, we're not listening. We're really not listening. So let's listen to understand rather than to respond. That's important. And as I told the people before, uh, two ears and one mouth God gave us, so maybe we should listen twice as much as we speak. And, and uh, at this stage, I have my other wee funny story that I want to share with you at this time. I know time's running on on us here, but anyway, uh, in terms of communication... It says, this is a little joke about communication, which is interesting. Uh, it says, while attending a marriage seminar dealing with communication, Colin and his wife Rita listen to the instructor. It's essential that husbands and wives know the things that are important to each other, he said. Then the instructor addressed the man, saying, for example, can you name your wife's favorite flower? And Colin, smiling, looking a little nervous, he leaned over and he touched his wife's arm gently, and he whispered, it's self-raising, isn't it, dear? <laughs> so... so <laughs> I, I, I don't tell what happened after that. I'll leave it up to your own imagination. So anyway, in essence, what this is leading me to suggest to you is that we should encounter people where they are, not where you'd like them to be. 
We have this great capacity within ourselves to fix everybody else. We know what's wrong with everybody else, and if only they would do the A, B, and C, they'd be perfect people. But it's not like that. The only person we can change is ourselves. And if we want the people around us to change, then we need to change the person looking back at us in the mirror. If we change and fix ourselves, you know what? The people around us will change automatically because we'll see them through a different lens. We'll, as we say up in the north, we'll have caught ourselves on, catch yourself on. Do you ever hear that statement? Catch yourself on. In essence, it means take a step back and look at yourself. Look what you're doing. And, and then you might maybe change some of the ways you behave. So anyway, uh, the, the thing that we, we suggest here too is avoid having to be right all the time. And uh, I'm reliably informed this is more difficult for men than, than, than ladies. Uh, but anyway, you, you can be a judge of that. So back to what I was saying before is about bringing the energy and bringing that feel-good factor to where you're at. There's an old Chinese proverb that sums this up very nicely, and it says, the person who doesn't smile shouldn't open a shop. And, and so it is, because you know this yourself. You've been in shops where people have no time for you. They're on the mobile phone, they're talking, shouting across the corridor to somebody else. They throw the stuff out to you as if you don't exist. They never smile with you, never engage with you. And then if you go to another shop who does something very differently, they speak to you the time of day, they have a con short conversation with you, they make you feel that, they, that you are important to them. So don't forget that. These Chinese proverbs are quite, they're quite profound and quite wise. So the person who doesn't smile shouldn't open a shop. Bring that wee note with you wherever you go. And, and so in essence, what the other point in that is too, that we need to encourage others to talk about themselves. We need to put a lid on what we're saying about ourselves. We're too easy to tell all about us. Let, that, let the other people find that out from us. When we have enough people prepared to ask, we'll be asked in due course about what we're all about. We don't have to tell people. So listen to the people around you and find out about them. And I guarantee you will become better company to those people and they will enjoy your company much more. I heard a word listen, uh, mentioned there before too, and I mentioned it earlier myself too, about discipline. Discipline is so important in life in general. Discipline about everything that we do. And traditionally, I believe it gets a negative press. Maybe going back to school days where you were disciplined for not doing the things you should have done. But I think we've got to turn that on its head entirely. The best discipline comes from within. It's a choice. We decide to do what we want to do. It's not because somebody else is making us, somebody else is telling us, or even somebody else tells us, this will be good for you. We need to discover it for ourselves. It's good to be disciplined in all that we do. And therefore, we choose good practice for the team benefit and for our own benefit. So we, we're thinking about creating good habits. And there's an old statement or uh, saying from Aristotle which says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act but a habit. So we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act but a habit. So it's about doing things and being dogged about repeating it, but I think always try to add value. It's not just about repeating for repeating's sake. You're thinking about it. You're reviewing it. You're saying, how could I, if I had the chance to do that again, what did I learn from my last engagement with somebody that I thought might have been a better outcome? So there's always learning. And then there's learning when you get a good outcome too. So always believe in the discipline of doing things well and seeing how you can add value to it. So I think that, that helps uh, us get things done better. Again, it's about, and, and I know that your organization is so much about this, and so is good business in any shape or form, about cooperation. And it's really about helping others. And, it's about, and, and, and again, it's about much more can be accomplished if no one cares who gets the credit. It's about getting things done collectively. And it's about cooperating with the people in your team and in and other teams as well, and being cooperating with the whole ethos of what your organization is about. That if you're good for the organization, then people in other groups, will it'll be good for them too. People need a good story about what you're about, about the products that you bring to the community and you bring to the people that you know and that you distribute within your organization. I think that's all good, all good. So really, it's about listening to others uh, as much as, as speaking, I really do believe that. And listening is a real good quality to have, it's a sign of strength. And to welcome new ways of thinking. I say always, uh, of course, there's a template for success. And there's always new ways of thinking about it. So it's not just about making things work, but about making them work better. That's our challenge, not making things work, but how do we make them work better? And again, it's about what's right, not who's right. It's doing the right thing, and it doesn't matter who says it or anything else. So what I'm saying is that strong, a strong leader accept, accepts blame and gives credit, and a weak leader accepts credit and gives blame. That's a very stark fact, but it is a fact. A strong leader accepts blame, gives credit. A weak leader accepts credit and gives blame. I really do believe that's the case. And just to uh, enforce the whole idea of why I think it's really important that you listen well 
have another of my wee stories here to tell you. So, this is very important. It says, a police officer stopped at a farm and told the old farmer, I need to inspect your farm for illegally growing drugs. The farmer said, OK, as long as you don't go over there into that field over there. The policeman sneered nastily. I think you'll find, sir, I have the authority of the police force behind me. He pulled out his badge. See this? It means I'm allowed to go wherever I want. No questions asked. No answers given. I'm in charge, understand, old man? The farmer nodded politely and went about his chores. A short time later, he heard loud screams. He looked up to see the policeman running for his life, pursued by the farmer's big bull. With every step, the beast was gaining ground. The policeman looked terrified. The farmer threw down his tools. He ran to the fence and shouted at the top of his lungs, your badge, show him your badge. <laughs> <laughs> So it is good to listen to what you're told from time to time. <laughs> Again, I suppose, in the context of what we're about here, how we help ourselves and others grow, uh, it's about really teaching people what they need to know. If you have learned and you have studied something to a good degree, then the real challenge for you is that you can share that learning with others in such a way that they understand. It's not just telling them with great confidence in your business that you do A, B, and C, and you do it this way, and that's great. You have to check then, is that what they're hearing? Do they understand what it is you're saying? And do they see it through the same lens that you believe they might see it through? That's important. So really about coaching your people. Uh, again, it's so important to coach them in the proper way. And again, understand what makes them tick. Different people are enthused by different things. And it's good to know what people really like in life. And if you can get them to talk about that, then I think they're always going to be in a better place to be in business with you or to do business with you. So create that good environment again. Again, we need to be firm in our convictions. We need to set our expectations high. If we want to be good leaders, we want to be good at what we do. So, but to do that as well, we've got to show, and I heard this before today, to show some humanity. You know, reinforce your people matter philosophy. It's so important that people matter and the things in their lives matter because it's not just this sort of cutthroat world that we live in where it's just hashtag number one stuff that you hear and see so often. It's not about that at all. It's about what can you give? How can you be helpful? How can you be a human person who has got compassion for those around you as well as being a good business person? So we need to be seen as a leader, seen as the one in charge for sure, and collect and pursuing the collective vision. That's all great. But this is important. You need to live your message and lead by example. Lead by example. Go from knowing what's right to doing what's right to being what's right. So a leader's target is to be a liberator, not a limiter of people's highest talent, if you like. So you're, uh, the successful leader doesn't create a huge amount of followers. They create more leaders. That's what you're about. So you want to create more leaders, people who want to be leaders themselves and see what it takes to be a leader. So as I said then, language is so important. The use of language, the body language that I talked about already, the idea of the enthusiasm of your voice and, and the way you carry yourself, that zest for life, being an energy giver. I tell people in sport this all the time, that there's only one of two things you can be in, in life, and that is you can be an energy giver or an energy sapper, and there is no in between. If you're not giving energy to the company you're in, you're draining it, and people don't need to be drained of energy. They need to be given energy. So don't find yourself, there is no in between. I can't get that place in between. If you're not giving energy, you're draining it. So where's the best place to be then? Be an energy giver. And to do that, it's good to speak well of others. It's not in our culture very much, you know. We're not the best at speaking well of others. We're not the best at catching people doing things well. You know, we see this time and time again with our famous or infamous TV pundits in sport and other places. They are fault finders. They want to find what's wrong with our game, what somebody did something wrong, instead of focusing first on what's so good about what we're seeing here. What, what are these people doing well? So catch people doing things well, speak enthusiastically about others, acknowledge their importance as an individual, as a, as a person created like the rest of us, you know, for a purpose, a single purpose. We were never, never two of us were created to do the same thing. We we're all created as unique human beings. And don't, don't, uh, don't ever miss that point that everybody's got that ability to be, to be uh, something different and something special. Again, I suppose, and we've heard it today as well before, you know, <laughs> without grafters, Without hard workers, then there will be no finished product. There'll be no great deal. So we should appreciate the assists. There's lots of people who make assists, and that's all of the people who work with us. 
People that says we talk about it in sport, and at least now people in sport are getting recognition. It's not just about the goal scorer, it's about the people who created that score. So again, in life, uh, we will not achieve an awful lot if we are not prepared to be grafters, if we're not prepared to work hard. So that's the key thing we have to be as a hard worker, first and foremost. That's, uh, sometimes people think there must be something more special and magical than that, but there isn't. Hard work is the baseline for every success that ever happened. And then we don't want or desire a team of clones. I think that's where we go back to this individuality, this uniqueness that we all have. So we don't want a team of clones. I wouldn't like a team of clones. Even the best player I had on the field, I wouldn't want them all to be exactly like that, because that's boring. It's lovely to see different people with different skill sets bringing the best of themselves to the party. And that's our job as leaders, is to help people discover the best of themselves and then be able to go and deliver the best of themselves. That to me is, is critical. And so I think it's good that we, we, we could be aware of that. And again, I'm gonna say, what we wanna compare to others, compare their industry rather than their perceived talent. So if you wanna challenge, I often say this to our players too, challenge, if you wanna challenge anybody here, challenge the hardest worker in this team. And you'll know in any team game or any sport, there's one or two players are known for their hard work. They know, and they just people recognize that they work harder than everybody else. And that's the challenge. Just challenge that person's work rate. Don't be trying to be like them as a, and a clone of theirs. That's not the way to do it. So again, I'm gonna tell you a wee story. This is maybe nothing to do with this at all, but it's just again, to be judging people, judging people as you find them, uh, you know, rather than what you think they're like. And if there's any teachers in here, which I was one myself for a long time, don't take this badly. And if there's any psychologists in here, don't take this badly either because it happens sometimes, people say this about you. Anyway, this is a little story of a little Johnny with a name here, and he was out. He was, the teacher gave him, and he, was, he, needed, uh, he, was, he needed some help. He, he considered sort of needed he had learning difficulties, if you like, he needed some special help. So the teacher was going around giving him some uh, molding clay to go and make something with it. So she gave him this molding clay and come around a wee while after and says, Johnny, uh, how are you? Uh, he said, well, he says, what do you got there? The teacher says, what do you got there? He says, I've got a lump of cow dung. She says, and, and the teacher says, well, what are you making with it? She says, I'm making a teacher. Uh, so <laughs> she didn't think that was the right answer. She says, I better get the school principal for this. This is not nice, you know. So the principal come along, and Johnny was working away at it, and he says, well, Johnny, what do you got there? And he says, I have some cow dung. And the principal says, well, what are you making with it? He says, I'm making a principal. Uh, so that wasn't the right answer either. He, he thought, see, this is a job for the school psychologist. So they sent for the school psychologist, and he says, that's no problem, I, I'll deal with this, I've seen this before. No, she says, hi, Johnny, and Johnny says, hi. He says, I bet I know what you've got there. And Johnny says, what have I got? He says, you have a lump of cow dung. And Johnny says, yes. He says, I bet it's better still to know what you're making with it. Johnny says, what am I making? He says, you're making a psychologist. Johnny says, wrong, not enough cow dung. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. Um, that's so the story goes, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, what we'll just finish off a few things with you here about leadership in many ways is about balance. It's about keeping all things in perspective. It's about maintaining self-control and, and avoiding excessive highs or lows. And that's very important. We can't get too high when things are going well because I believe if we're level like that, then when things don't go so well, we won't be in a depressive state either. So it's finding that middle road and, and, and you know, being comfortable when you're doing well and enjoying it, uh, but not gloating over it. And then when things don't go quite the way you want them to do, well, I can deal with that too. I, mean, because I didn't get too high when I was high. I'm not gonna get too low when things aren't going well. So but John Wooden described this as maintaining poise in times of turmoil and triumph. And if we can have poise when things are really good and when things are not so good, then that's what poise is really about. It's about holding yourself well. So again, we need to strive for mental and emotional balance in all areas of our lives. That's what we all need to do to be people who live in this world anyway. We strive for mental and emotional balance in everything that we do. So ultimately, the better your balance, the better your leadership. And the better your leadership, the better your team, the better you are, and the better all around for your organization. And ultimately, accountability is, is, is key to all of this. Team members ought to assume personal responsibility. Don't be depending on somebody else to always keep you pointing and moving and getting in the right direction. You have got to work at it yourself. You've got to take on the responsibility. You've got to take responsibility for your own outcome. And then there'll be loads of help there for you to make it better. But you must 
take that. And somebody says as well, you know, don't expect God to guide your steps if you're not prepared to move your feet. So, you know, that's simple, but it's true. You've got to move your feet if you want to get things done. So really, uh, as I said to people in, 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 in the sporting context too, good work in the training field could be quickly undone by poor life choices outside of it. It's no different in the world of business or work either. If you're burning the candle at both ends, you probably won't be a very successful person. You will be drained, you'll be lacking energy and lacking drive. So have a bit of balance, a bit of discipline, a bit of self-discipline in your life will always be good. And the last couple of things I'll say to you is, um, one of them here is about commitment. And I think this is, this is, I have definitions of things that I come across here and there, and I think this is a really good definition of commitment. And I think it works for what you're about as well. And it says, doing what you said you would do long after the mood you set it in has left you. That's what commitment is. Doing what you said you would do long after the mood you said it has left you. So, you might go out of a meeting or go to somewhere like today on a high and you're going to go on the world, right? But an hour, two hours, two days, two weeks down the line, have you got that same drive? Have you got that same energy? I tell this to our sports people as well, that in the months of October and November, they're very committed to winning the championship the next year. And they're going to do everything that's possible to make that happen. But they're on a high stool. And then when it comes to January, February and March, when the work needs to be put in to make that happen, they're not just quite so committed. There's just maybe a wee bit of a, a hint of, um, well, I don't know if I'm ready for that or not. So doing what you said you would do long after the mood you've said in has left you is very important. Be committed in the small things and the big things will take care of themselves. If we're committed, that's, that's, that's building blocks. That's one step at a time. Do what you do well at every level and then you will be, have a good foundation for getting to the next level. Again, be aware of the give up mentality. There's a give up mentality in all of us and we have to challenge that because if we don't challenge it and say, I see you coming here, doubt, I see you coming here, this fear of failure, I see this coming, but you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn this in his head. I'm gonna make this a positive. I'm gonna say, I've met you, I can deal with you and I'm going on. Just get that into your head. So when the going gets tough, the tough get going and see obstacles as an opportunity to stretch. I think they're very important things to think about. And the last couple of things I'll share with you here too is just, um, it's a John Wooden one as well. And this is in essence what your whole business is about too. And um, it says the main ingredient of stardom is the rest of the team. The main ingredient of stardom is the rest of the team. Simply because that statement just puts others first. It's putting other people first. And you know the opposite of it, as we talked about the hashtag number one job, it says the problem with being in a rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. So that's the alternative. That's the alternative, we have those two choices. And finally, a couple of wee things I'll share with you here just to end on a bit of fun as well. It says if you lend somebody 50 euro and never see them again, it is probably worth it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the finally, finally saying, um, as you will gather, I like to take an optimistic take on life. I like to see the bright side of life. Not, not uh, for one minute believing that there isn't some times when challenges come our way. Of course they do. But it's better to be an optimistic person in as far as we can and, and bring that optimism to the people that you meet on life's journey. And uh, I think you'll be better company for that. You'll be better for yourself. You'll be better for your business. And you will just enjoy life better ultimately. So here's the, the, the proof of the pudding, if you like, about an optimist here. Apologies to those who heard the wee story before, but you can laugh again as well. Um, there's a story of identical twins. One was a hope-filled optimist. Everything is coming up roses, he would say. The other twin was a sad and hopeless pessimist. He thought that Murphy, as in Murphy's Law, was an optimist. The worried parents of the boys brought them to the local psychologist, that person again. He suggested to the parents a plan to balance the twins' personalities. On the next birthday, put them in separate rooms to open their gifts. Give the pessimist the best toys you can afford and give the optimist a box of manure. That stuff again. The parents followed these instructions and carefully observed the results. When they peeked in on the pessimist, they heard him audibly complaining. I don't like the color of this computer. I'll bet this calculator will break. I don't like this game. I know someone who's got a bigger toy car than this. Tiptoeing across the corridor, the parents peeked in, saw the little optimist gleefully throwing the manure up in the air. He was giggling. You can't fool me. Well, there's this much manure, there's got to be a pony. <laughs> so, thank you very much. <laughs> Some questions now, I believe. <laughs> I think there's a short time now for a few questions. If you want a few questions, I'm here. I think I have 14 or 15 minutes to go here, so if you want to ask a few questions, that's fine.
right? Work away. With your sport and end, please. Can I ask, whenever you, I notice you as management on the sideline, there's never a flinch of, even if it's come and go time or point time, Mickey Hart is the camps man all the time, every time. How do you keep that up, Mickey? Or what do you do to keep that nice calmness all the time? Well, it's just, again, I'll, I'll, I'll have to credit John Wooden with the, that, because he was the first one who brought that philosophy to my mind when I read about it. And, and he again said it's about having poise in times of turmoil and, 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 and uh, triumph. And I suppose there's a great method in this too, in that if your players are on the field and in a difficult situation and look out at you and see you agitated and not in control of what you're supposed to be about, then they will probably more likely lose control as well. And then nobody will serve well. But if they look out and see, this seems to be a bad situation, but he's not too worried about it just there by his face anyway. So I think it's, it's positive in many ways. And it's something you have to acquire the skill to do it. I mean, but first of all, like anything in life, if you're not aware of it, then you can't achieve it. It's awareness, awareness. Anthony DeMello, have you ever read any of his stuff? He's a book about awareness. He says the unaware person is not alive. You have to be aware of who you are and what you're about and how you react and how you, how you react rather than how you're an actor. So, so sometimes we live life reacting to the things that happen around us when we really shouldn't do that. But if we don't, as I say to my own old famous statement, if we don't catch ourselves on, then we do do that. So it's about that awareness. And that doesn't mean to say that we'll always do the right thing, but we'll always know when we don't do the right thing. So that's a learning process. So it's about that awareness. So when you become aware of what it is you need to do and be, then, then you, bit by bit you get there. Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, an ever, an ever, it's a lifelong journey, you know? So I'm on that journey. I would have been on the right way now, but anyway, uh, you know, that's, that's what I believe anyway. So you, you can acquire that skill when you're aware of the value of it. Okay. <laughs> Mickey, thank you for coming here today. Where am I at? All right. right. <laughs> You've been at the top of the game for over two decades now. Is there anything you do on a daily basis, like a, a routine or something like that, to keep your mindset in a place where you can stay at the very top, uh, as you do? And uh, is there anything maybe you can, any, any tips you can share in that light for us? <laughs> right, right. Well, unfortunately, I'm not really at the top this last lucky years. So anyway, I wish I was. <laughs> but, um, no, I don't think, I think it's all to do, I think really what I shared with you is, is this attitude. It's this attitude to life. It's about this zest for life. And of course, within that, there's little routines and little things you can do that energize people and that, that, are, that create a little bit of a routine, if you like. But you can't be a slave to that either because you have to always open your mind. To, it's, it's about finding new things to do. It's about finding new ways of doing the same things. It's about finding new language for what you you believe is the core values that you're about and finding you like, and again, it's the way you deliver it. I'm, I'm just saying like, you know, you could go into anywhere to anybody and if you tell them a story with your head down and your shoulders down and you're not really putting any energy into what you're saying, they'll not excite them. But if you put energy into it and you say, you know, this is what I want here, this is what I want for myself, this is what I want for you, this is the way we're going about things and you have to be convinced of what you're about. If you haven't got the conviction of your own beliefs, then you're not going to convince many others that this is a good place to be. It's not saying that you're telling them they have to do this for you. You have to say, with you. Get people working with you and not for you. Then more will, more will get done. So it's just about bringing your own energy. And that's something you have to keep replenishing. You have to go back to see what else could I do that would be a little bit different. Um, and, and get good people around you. you know, Take the resources that you have in your team and, and, and engage with them. And, and everybody has got little nuggets of, of real valuable stuff that you just need to tap into. And then it's actually even better than coming from yourself. When you actually take something from some of your players or some of the people in your team and, and, you, and you share that with the rest of the team and you give them credit for it and you see this is good for all of us. You know, but you know, if you didn't share that with us, it would be a hidden nugget. So, and then everybody's thinking about how can I add value to what we're about here? How could I give something more than I'm given to date? So I just was getting everybody on that wavelength of I have something to give here and there's people want what I have to give and the more we give of ourselves, 
the greater the outcome will be for all of us. So I think, I don't hope that answers your question, but it's that kind of philosophy. It's a philosophy rather than a specific formula. It's a philosophy. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Mickey, how are you doing? Uh, Davey Nelson here. Like yourself, I'm a GA coach for the last couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And I follow your progress year in, year out. I'm a Mead man, by the way. You might know by the accent. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and um, last year, well, I'm intrigued by last year in the Tyrone team because I was one of the ones that thought Tyrone would beat Dublin in the All-Ireland <clears throat> semi-final. We've had a great season up to it. Mm -hmm. McKenna Cup, as usual, put in the back pocket early in the year. Decent National League, brilliant championship through Ulster. And what I'm getting to hear for the rest of the people here today is, uh, as I said, believing that you'd, I thought you could, you could beat the Dubs, and not too many people in my county thought the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, traditionally, the rivalry we would have with Dublin and mm -hmm. what you have had over the last <laughs> while as well. But my question for you is, 2018, you're there again, I'm delighted to see it. What message do you bring across to that group having fallen in the great theatre of Crow Park heavily last weekend in August? I was say very successful up to then, but a heavy defeat. How do you recalibrate that team for 2018 to show them the way that you can go further and maybe bring home Sam back to Toronto in 2018? Right, good question, very good question. <clears throat> It's, it's very much, again, a sense of balance. You know, this is how people perceive things. People are very uh, tuned in to the last thing you did. So the last thing we did was fall badly to Dublin, right? Now, we had four wonderful games before that. People are even talking about the way we played football because Dublin beat us by so much. They reckon that we were too defensive. We had no offensive options. The last two Ulster Tides that we won, we won them by being the most prolific scoring team since, 19, since records were kept in 1940. So last year and the year before, we won Ulster by scoring more than anyone else in the history of the game, right? So if we have been doing that, we must have been doing something right. And the fact that we lost to Dublin, lost so heavily, I have to pick through that sort of debris, if you like. And it's not, uh, there were times, if, if you really forensically analyze the game, the goal that was scored against us, I, I, this is what hurts me most of all, it was scored so early in the game, number one. Secondly, it was brought about because of a mistake on our part, mishandling the ball. Thirdly, because the young man who scored the goal wasn't doing what I'd like to have been doing if I was, on his, if I was his manager. He wasn't chasing back after our centre-half forward, or after our centre-half back. So he found himself in a really good position, in a way, because he was slightly lazy. And that's a pity. Now, you have to congratulate him for the way he finished it after that. It was superb, and, he was, and he's a great footballer, and he, and, he, and, he, and he could have taken a point and been happy with it, but he went for the throat and got a goal. So that changed the whole complexion of that game, because everyone would know who played Dublin that you have to hold them out for as long as possible. They're going to break you at some stage. They're going to get scores. You have to make it as difficult as, as possible for them to do that. And because he got that goal early on, it almost lifted that challenge off their heads. And then you, we have a lead here now. We can, we can actually afford to take our time to get other scores. We're no one rushed to get them. So, and that's what they did. And we were still playing our own style of game, which was very much a containment game and then a, on the break. But it's hard to play the containment game when you're four or five points down as we were at that stage. But at the same time, to change that while the game is live, that's very dangerous as well, because we could end up with a bigger hammering as it turned out. So. There's lots of things we did well that day as well, and we changed things around at half time. And at the start of the second half, we had, at the first five attacks we had, we got one point. Dublin, in the meantime, got one attack and one point. So if we had been more prolific with our own attacks, we could have closed the gap to two or three points maybe, and the world would have been different. But it's life, it's a fact. So all I'm saying is that what we had to say to our players is, you did a lot of things very well last year, and we had a, a sobering, experience in Crow Park. Now, I think that our players will learn more from the sobering experience than they will from the four victories that they had. So it's about turning setbacks on their head and bringing something positive out of them. And that's true for all walks of life. You know, you can see a, a setback or a rejection or something that went against you as something to 
cry about and close your eyes and go away and lie down somewhere. Or you can say, I'm going to learn from that. And you know what? If this ever presents itself again, this is not the way it's going to turn out. It's going to turn out very different. So I hope there's no Dublin people in here, but that won't work next year. <laughs> Hello, Mickey. My name is Finola Gallagher, and I'm a proud Leitrim woman who'll probably never get, make it to Croke Park. No, no. <laughs> um, just as a leader, um, there is, we hear so much about the fear of success as opposed to the fear of failure, that it's the fear of success that holds so many of us back rather than failure. Being a leader where so many people look to you for inspiration and where we all have our own doubts and I suppose our own weaknesses and failings, how do you keep yourself positive apart from the mindset of that? How do you keep yourself moving forward and not being afraid of stepping out and... I suppose, showing yourself as that leader and continually pushing yourself forward as that leader to inspire people. Right, right. Good question too. I mean, I suppose it's about, it's back to the basics again. You know, if you work hard at what you do, if you put the effort into what you're about and the players around you see the effort you're putting in, then they're going to respect you for that, number one. And secondly, how you engage with your players you have to engage them with them in a way that gets them to believe that more is possible for them. Yes, you have to allude to things that they might be able to do differently, and you show them sufficient video evidence of things they do well and things they might do differently. And again, it's around the language. You know, we can say people talk about strengths and weaknesses, success and failure. What about doing things well and doing things differently? Which in essence is the same thing but it's, it's both positive. The language is positive in both cases. So it's about that kind of belief. It's, it's about building relationships with the players that are, that are there and, and about letting them see that, that you love what you do and that you're always challenging yourself. You're not just thinking, this is the way I used to do this. And it should, that's, that's what I find annoying sometimes. You see some pundits or commentators saying that people would suffer from the same voice syndrome. They shouldn't. Because it shouldn't be the same voice syndrome. It should be different language, maybe from the same voice. But it shouldn't be as if you're repeating the things you always said and think that that's always going to work. It won't. So you have to find new ways of energizing the people that you work with. And in doing that, that challenges yourself to think of what you're about and to be resourceful. And again, to, to, to see your people as resources. So I think it's all about having an open mind to thinking there's always something more out there that I can tap into. There's always people around me who can add value to what I'm about. And, and you've got to have conviction. You can't be dithering and thinking, will this work or will it not? Or, and to be afraid of anything. You really, you can't be afraid. You respect for everything but fear nothing. And that's what you really be about. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Doris Emilia. Um, I have a question because I have two C-type goals on my gold card. Uh, one professional, one personal. Professional goal is to grow the company, which is happening. And uh, I put the mindset in the company, not for money, but for value. And I don't know, because I never find the, the um, taste of money. So I go for that. <coughs> and the second question is like, I have volleyball competition, that's my personal goal, and it will be in uh, Europe, in Prague, on the 2nd February. So uh, I put my uh, mindset to work, not for winning, but for success. Like, it's kind of mindset of thinking into mm. the play game, not mm. for, the, for winning. So yeah. I want to know if I work in the right place, like uh, with my mindset. Yeah, well, I, I think you are. I think it's a very good place to be working because it, it is, in essence, what it's all about. It's, it's, a, it's not about, you know, what's in this for me? You know, that's, what, that's, that's the selfish attitude. What can I get? What can I get? And then you're only out to grab for yourself. You're not you're looking at the bigger picture. You're looking at personal development. You're looking at developing the people around you. And your goal is to be successful. And if the bonus of money comes with that, Brilliant. And of course, in life and in, in business, you need to ha see that there's an add-on value to it. 
but it's about your attitude. I think you're in a very good place. I think your attitude is excellent, that it's about you enjoy what you do, you want to improve yourself, and you're not driven by money. Because if you're driven by money, then in my frame of mind is that money becomes your God. And I wouldn't like money to be my God, because I have a far better one that I go to, and, and, and he's more valued to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you.